I'm Sebastian Kinna. I'm Darren Kitchen. Wait, and to uh, every time. reverse that together, we uh, form the power of Wi-Fi panel really goodness, Hack 5. Um, Hack 5 just turned 10 years old as far as uh, on the 5th of August. That was pretty insane. So um, if anybody can tell me the name of the original theme music, they get free land turtle. Yeah, I didn't think so. <laughs> um, so what we're going to talk about today, do a little pineapple primer. For those of you who aren't familiar, we're going to quickly recap the changes in the Wi-Fi landscape as this is a game of cat and mouse that we're continuously uh, enjoying. We're going to talk a little bit about PineAP, the success of that, what we've done to make it better, some of the new features. Um, we're going to get into a little analysis of uh, some of the captures that we've done uh, with that. And we're going to talk about security. And then we're going to talk about the future of the fruit. So what is the Wi-Fi Pineapple? It's a rogue access point. Um, it's so many things. It's a pen test pivot box, obviously. Uh, it's most known for its intuitive web interface. You know, the way that we just basically like package up these tools and make it simple because like, okay, sure, you may know like all of the esoteric tac tac p colon underscore. That's cool. Don't get me wrong. I love that. Sometimes I just want to, like, make it do the thing. <laughs> so, um, with that, what it does best is it's kind of most known as its, uh, for its rogue access point feature. Uh, again, the Pine AP suite. Um, and that what that provides is being a rogue access point says, like, hey, I'm really interested in collecting clients, but Why? Right, because that's only like one step of the game, and, and the idea is to poise yourself on the network as the man in the middle, much like Comcast is at home for you. <laughs> um, we also uh, do really well remote management out of band, which is a lot of times fun, especially if you're using this as like a pen test pivot box. Drop it on an organization, get a 3G signal out. Uh, that leads in with pen test pivot, and of course the extensible uh, platform that we've built that a lot of people have. Uh, contributed to in the way of infusions and whatnot. So um, really trying to build a platform that's as easy as possible to develop for. And uh, we're, we're always, we're constantly amazed when we come to DEF CON and we hear the stories of the esoteric things that, are, that the Wi-Fi Pineapple is being used for. So we love that stuff. It's not space, dude. It's, He's used to more, not less. Sorry. Yeah. So anyway, our mission is to create simple, affordable, and effective tools for the penetration testers, the systems administrators, the geek metroids. Um, and quite simply, our philosophy is make it do the thing. Those are turtles. Uh, Seb, you want to walk us through the Wi-Fi landscape oh, yeah. and how it's evolved? So um, we all, hopefully, most people here are familiar with the karma attack that used to exist before. Yeah? No? Wow, two, two people? That's three people, okay, four people. Fun, All right, okay, that's better. That's cool. um, right, so so there used to be this thing called, or there still is, but there used to be this thing called Karma. And the way it worked is basically that uh, your wireless devices would search for a certain network and say, uh, is my Acme Wi-Fi around? And all that Karma would say, or the pineapple in that case would say, is yes, I am. And then the connection would be made. So um, that, that obviously doesn't work well anymore. Well, so, uh, it worked really well for its time. It worked the same way that, say, the mirror in Harry Potter worked, which was, you know, you look at it and you see what, what you want to see. So if what you're looking for is Linksys, you're going to see Linksys. And what you're looking for is Coffee Shop Wireless, you're going to see Coffee Shop Wireless. But that doesn't necessi that's not necessarily the way that devices work anymore. Um, before we go any further, of course, we need to real quick touch on some real basics of Wi-Fi. Um, Mainly the management frames, those are the things that we're most interested in, and that's what allows us to do uh, some fun little tricks. So beacon frames, there's only one type. They're just beacons. They're just little advertisements. They're like billboards on the side of the road so that everybody can see them and say, like, hey, come over to here to the, this place. Uh, probes come in two forms. Probe requests, again, uh, I'm looking for Linksys. I'm looking for that coffee shop. And, of course, the subsequent probe response, which would be, I am that Linksys or I am that coffee shop. And, uh, and the probe response is actually very similar to a beacon. I think there's only a few hex values that are even 
different in the packet. It just basically says like, here's the modes that I support. Uh, here's my encryption standard. Here's, you know, all the ways that I like to do things. And then there's, uh, you know, either creating re the relationship or destroying the relationship, the association and the authentication, and likewise the disassociation and the deauthentication. And those are just packets that say, let's be friends or GTFO. Okay, so uh, Karma worked, as I said before, because it's convenient. You want your device to turn on, you want to open your laptop lid and you want to automatically connect. And before that was done because you were probing for your PNL, your preferred network list. Most devices, or a lot of devices, surprisingly, some have reverted what they were doing, but we'll get into that later. Um, so a lot of devices, they probe to broadcast now versus for probing for a specific SSID. So they won't ask for Acme Corp anymore. They will ask for broadcast and then every access point responds and then they can pick from the access points that they want. So that pretty much thwarts the, the entire Karma attack the way it used to work. Um, and it's because of Karma and Karma success that uh, this whole landscape has changed and vendor implementations have changed as such. And, and it changes the convenience. I mean, as we know, like convenience and security are constantly at odds. It's obviously faster if you know the access point you want to directly query it and say, like, let's be friends instead of like saying, is anyone out there? and waiting around. Um, and so what it does is it means that the, the landscape is more like a, a game of go fish now, where it's like, hey, are you still there? And then, uh, of course, that varies by the vendor's implementation, but you kind of have to know ahead of time what may possibly be in that device's preferred network list. Right, and uh, not only that, the, the variation in terms of how these things are implemented is so different from vendor to vendor. So, for example, uh, some devices will still probe for the network they want, but if uh, they do not see the actual beacons but only see uh, probe responses or association responses, uh, requests or responses in that matter, um, the, uh, the access point will notice it's not a real access point and it'll actually blacklist that. So it'll not connect, even though it's probed, it got a response, it'll say, okay, well, you're not a real access point. So there's that. Then we have devices that just probe to broadcast, as we were saying. Then there's devices that have both of that. Some devices, um, we'll get into that a little bit yeah. later again, but uh, huge range in, in, in the implementations and some are more, more vulnerable than others and some are very locked down. I don't know, Black Phone, if you guys know that, um, you should. Uh, you know, they, they changed a few things lately and it's, it's awesome and it, you know, protects you against these type of attacks. So in this ever-changing Wi-Fi landscape, what of course is a Wi-Fi pineapple to do, uh, which led us to introduce the PineAP suite, which extends on Karma, because uh, Karma was great at just saying yes. Um, anybody here recall the code name for the project before just Wi-Fi pineapple? All right. Like guys uh, fight over the land turtle. Oops. Totally missed. You can't throw. Can I you? can't throw. Okay. Right. So uh, so that led to building an entire suite because there's lots of um, lots of other ways that we can basically make the honey pot sweeter. You know, uh, karma is just like a hook, and just like hanging out in the pond, and piney pea is like a hook with a with a worm on it, if you will. Right. So, um, as, as I was just saying, basically, not, devices don't start probing for their PNL anymore. They are probing to broadcast. And it's hard to now know what they're probing for. There's different methods of getting the PNL of devices or getting the best guess that we know. But the way we do it is we do it over something called SSID harvesting, where we take all the probe, requ uh, res uh, probe requests and all the, uh, the beacons that we see and we memorize them. We can sort them, we have a database for them, and uh, we can then see what devices would probably respond to what, uh, what SSIDs. And um, we reinforce that by doing um, beacon injections, which is basically just we're beaconing out that we're this access point. So we're actively saying we are this access point because we've seen other devices probe. The reason why that works is normally in uh, a certain location, you or a, a certain site that you're working on, uh, is going to have devices that are differentiating in terms of uh, who uh, the, the the sorry the manufacturers the uh, the policies that they have implemented. So you're going to be getting some overlap in terms of what SSIDs they're looking for, what uh, APs they're looking for. Um, so that's what uh, beacon injection is, and then uh, beacon response is actually something quite 
odd. It's kind of an anomaly here. Um, you can send beacons. Normally, beacons are sent to broadcast. Um, you can target a specific MAC address with them. You just switch out the MAC. And what happens is most devices will just ignore that uh, that frame because it's not meant for them, right? So they don't care. They ignore the packet and they won't show it. So it won't show up if you look at your phone and you look at all the APs that are around you, you're not going to see the ones that are not targeted towards you. So I was saying the vendor implementation where uh, the vendor requires beacons to be visible before it will actually associate. So you have to be actively beaconing what they're looking for. Um, the way that we the way we do that is we actually send them targeted so that when you look on your phone or at least when when the normal uh, um, the normal clients that are around when they uh, when they then look at their devices it doesn't seem obvious obviously the packets are there so if you use Wireshark or uh, uh, wireless IDS um, this is going to throw up a lot of red flags and we'll talk about that a little bit too but um, yeah. Right, and then recon mode, which is basically a, and we're going to expand on that more in a bit, but basically it's a part of the suite that allows you to visualize the Wi-Fi landscape, uh, which aids considerably in targeting and filtering and making sure that you are uh, auditing just the access points and just the clients that you're uh, particularly interested in. And um, so it's kind of like a front end to a lot of the features of the PineAP suite. Right, and that's that's a quick overview of what we implemented. We gave a whole talk on that last year, and um, right, and and the idea there is, you know, building the the recon mode. The idea was to give you a landscape so that you're not just turning on the pineapple and turning on Karma, which was pretty much. I mean, this is the revolution. We're in like the fifth iteration, the Mark Five. You know, the original it was just like on and off, right? You turn on Karma, and like, well, there goes the neighborhood, and. Uh, and now we, we don't think that's really the best way to use the tool. So we've set it up in such a way where you can actually specify filters. So there's allow lists and deny lists. And you can do that based on SSID. If you're only interested in a particular uh, access point, say everybody in the company associates with this set access point, or the company is across the street from a coffee shop where they use that set access point, um, you can filter by that or by the MAC address. So if you're uh, contracted to just target the CFO, you can get this, the CFO's MAC address, and make sure that only he can connect to, or he or she can connect to your device and uh, allow you to do that man-in-the-middle attack. Um, what's also really interesting here about the Piney Peace Suite is that not only are we able to set targets, you know, as opposed to just broadcast, meaning everyone, um, we can actually also set the source, which is kind of novel. Right. So, uh, again, this is something that, that we can do because we're just injecting frames. Uh, we uh, we can take any type of pineapple. So say you have multiple pineapples set up in a certain vicinity and they're connected in one shape or form, or even if they're not, you'll be able to uh, set the source to one pineapple. So say you want to use five pineapples around a certain site to uh, tell clients to connect to one pineapple. You can do this by changing your source, making it seem like it's coming from the original, the, the one pineapple you're using as a collection and as the actual access point, which might be providing internet. So you can actually uh, couple pineapples that way. Yep. Um, and then we can, of course, you know, set it to use different intervals, and we'll take more about that later. But basically, it's um, you know, speeding up the attacks and, and being more, just saturating the airways more with these kinds of attacks. Um, and actually, on the interval thing, hmm. uh, 802.11 is expressed in things called time units, and it has to do with the maths. But, um, but really, when it comes to 802.11, or really a lot of wireless protocols, you know, timing is everything. And, and with, with uh, Wi-Fi, everything's done in microseconds. But um, we learned this in particular while we were hanging out in San Francisco at 3 in the morning uh, camped outside of T-Mobile to get be the first in line for some god awful reason to buy the Nexus Six. Um, I don't recommend hanging out on Third and Market in San Francisco at three in the morning. But we did learn uh, that there's security that patrols this one particular building that had scaffolding all around it. They were doing um, some construction. Security guard comes out on a set interval, and then this random tweaker shows up, and like in our hoodies, we literally have like Mason tasers ready to go, and he's like. Hey, will you watch my bag? <laughs> so, uh, you know, we, we didn't really want to watch this random guy's bag. And we're like, well, we'd prefer not to. And he just drops his bag and says, all right, cool. Drops his bag on the side. 
And then, like, a spider climbs that scaffolding up about, I don't know, 12, yeah, like, 16 floors, something like that. Climbs up, cuts a pe- like a, a hole in the tarp that's covering the, the uh, window, I suppose, and climbs in. <laughs> so, climbs in, and on his way out, well, you, you know, at some point, spends five, ten minutes gone. We're thinking, what the hell is going on? But, like, you know, s- just focus on just ignoring this. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, and you know, security guards nowhere to be seen. Um, and then, you know, he climbs back down, doesn't seem to have done anything, but he comes back down and grabs his bag and comes up to us. He's like, he's and like, he just goes, dude. And we're like, okay, I mean, I guess I have to fist bump because I don't know what he's going to do next. And he goes, timing is everything. And at that exact, <laughs> and at that exact moment, the security guard shows back. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so. With 802.11 time units, uh, they're roughly 1024 microseconds. It has to do with clock cycles. Uh, there's roughly 976 of them per second. And what that means is uh, beacon frames are typically addressed as an interval, right? So how many time units are we going to wait in between each chirp? And that chirp just says, hey, I'm Linksys. Connect to me. So typically most routers will wait 100 time units or, you know, They do it nine times per second. And with that, what you end up doing is you end up chirping out about 108 possible ESS IDs per second. Right, and that's if you go with a standard uh, time unit that's recommended. Um, We don't really do that. We we wanted to go faster. So um, we do uh, about twice as many. Um, Nope, that's not true. Almost, almost. Yeah. Three, many. almost many. We go faster, and that's Over the default 9, interval. And th- and the, the the reason why we do for the for the normal interval, uh, the reason why we go at this speed is just because we can go faster. We don't have to wait on certain other activities. Another AP would have to, um, but uh, it's it's also very super CPU intensive if we you know go much faster than that as in between packets. So we have aggressive mode. We implemented that, and it is a lot faster. We're down to about six hundred. Uh, microseconds between uh, beacons. So, yeah, and so what that means is we can basically beacon out not just, you know, Linksys over and over and over again nine times, but we have the opportunity to do hundreds of times per second. And the way that devices channel hop looking for devices, so they'll come online and they'll listen on channel one, hey, anything around, okay, move to channel two and do that, and they'll loop over and over and over. So they may only see one. And that may be good enough for it to just show up in the network list, which means that at these intervals, we're able to handle thousands of SSIDs in the uh, SSID pool, if you will, and uh, successfully transmit those out. And I know what you're thinking. Yeah, we can go faster. So while developing this, we decided to go a lot faster, put powerful hardware behind it, i7, fast wireless cards, and just you know, thought, let's blow that out and let's see what happens. And um, if you ever want to learn how to turn a, an Android phone into a turtle, that is how you do hey, it. Hey, 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 I take offense to that. The turtle's pretty rad. Turn it into a... No, no I'm, I meant more in terms of speed, but, you know... Well, let's just, say snail. It's another slug. thing with a shell. Slug? slug? Like slug. Okay. Yeah. okay. Well, anyway, to slug your Android, all you have to do is beacon out how many time unit intervals? Right. None. None. Just do them all. <laughs> all right, well... Kind of. there's, there's one inherent problem with that, of course, if you keep saying, hey, connect to me on channel one, hey, connect to me on channel one, hey, connect to me on channel one. Because unlike all of the other like datagram frames that use the control frames, which use like things like clear to send and request to send and things of that nature, uh, these are like ADSB or any other dumb protocol that doesn't know what's around. And it's basically a really bad time division multiplexing or something. It's just like, it's just going to squash anything. Inherently knowing that, well, you know, it's TCP that we're going to be squashing, so they'll resend and everything will be cool. Um, so, yeah, if you do that, you just F over the entire spectrum. So don't do that. Yeah, that's no good. All right, so we, we covered harvesting a lot uh, a little bit before. Uh, basically, we harvest probe requests. We uh, harvest beacons using recon mode. Uh, you could use Wiggle to find uh, to do a bit of recon on your sense. And we actually, the talk we did at uh, at B-Sides, we were told that we have to implement Wiggle onto the Pineapple or a decent API for it. Um, if you're not familiar with Wiggle, Wiggle.net, Wiggle.net with one G, by the way, 
uh, is kind of like a open source version of Skyhook or some of those other geolocation services that collect the locations of access points, which is great as augmentation to GPS and things like that. Um, and this kind of spawned out of the whole like you know uh, early 2000s war driving movement. And it's really cool because people still today like are dumping Kismet logs full of SSIDs and GPS, which are pretty fantastic too. Because if you wanted to know, hey, what are all the access points around 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, you just go on Wiggle and find out. And then you could download those and pop them into your management list. And now Dogma would start making it look like you're in downtown DC, um, which is fun. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and there's, there's, there's a lot of things you could do with that. So if you know you have a site and you know that there's information on Wiggle, you might as well plug it into Pine AP and you'll be able to use that again. That way you can ensure that you get the most out of it. So while it's not as easy as Karma used to be, it is the, the, you know, the best there is for the current situation right now. Of course, the situation that you're most likely going to be in is if you come in to audit an organization, uh, you may be given a scope of engagement, in which case it would probably behoove you to fire up recon mode, see what the landscape is around there, and then right from within recon mode, you can go ahead and add to that SSID list based on the access points in the area, um, which you want to clone. Right. Oh, and we have a tractor. Okay, um, you want to do that one? Yeah. So if Pine AP is the ammunition, then, then uh, Recon Mode is the battlefield. It provides that situational awareness where you have like a good sense of, uh, of what's around you. And, and we've seen site surveys before. Uh, you can pull up a site survey on your phone or whatever have you. But that typically only shows you the nearby access points. And that's only like half the picture. In fact, it's probably even less than that. Because uh, what we're truly interested in are, are clients. And specifically, the intelligence we can gather from which clients are connected to which access points. So the way that recon mode works is it displays to you uh, all of the access points nearby, but then underneath them, it displays all of the MAC addresses of the access points, or sorry, the, uh, the stations connected to that base station, the um, clients connected to that AP. And with that, you know, okay, so I'm here to target Acme. Now I know here's the MAC addresses that are connected to that Acme access point, regardless of whether it's WPA, Enterprise, or whatever have you. Um, and so with that, you can go ahead and set your filters so that you can limit the scope of your engagement. And likewise, you can also see not just clients that are connected to access points, but you can also see unassociated clients. And so what that means is these are clients that have Wi-Fi on, and particularly that are sending out probe requests. So they're like the lowest hanging fruit. These are uh, the, the clients that just want to connect to an access point. It just so happens that the access point that they're looking for isn't in the vicinity, otherwise they'd be on one of the other ones in the list. So the last one is a bit of a weird one. It's out of range clients and most people get really confused by that. Um, what that means is we are able to, we have two radios on the pineapple. And one is a bit stronger than the other, and there's a few differences between them. Um, but basically what this comes down to is that uh, we have the, the uh, WLAN 0, which is the one that we get all the clients to connect to. It's a little bit weaker than WLAN 1, which is what we use to scan for clients, which is what we use to, to gather this, this data this on, on the, the site. And then we match the two up. So there are some clients that you're not able to actually currently get onto your pineapple because you're too far away, or because the access point, at least, that they're connected to is too far away. So they might be connected to something, or they are connected to an access point. However, we can't see that access point using WN0, so we're probably out of effective range of if we do kick it off from the access point to bring it back to us. So it's something to be aware of, because if that's one of your targets that you're meant to you know, test for um, or find, uh, then you might have to move closer, you might have to change locations, or you might have to just you know, know. Uh, Recon Mode also provides a really convenient interface to a lot of the other Pine AP uh, stuff like being able to deauthenticate a client. So you're like, okay, great. So I was brought in to target just the CFO. I've got his MAC address. There he is connected to the Acme Wi-Fi, and I can see him. Fantastic. Click on him, say deauth. He drops off. Do that maybe a few times, and eventually that device may just get tired of trying to reconnect to that network, start looking at other networks in their PNL, and um, and then, you know, connect to you. That's the hope. Uh, this also allows you to do that said filtering. So, you know, add him to uh, or her, your, your filter list so that uh, only the CFO will connect to you. 
likewise, if you're brought into or audit the entire organization, you may just de-auth the entire organization by clicking on the SSID of Acmeco and then you know, kick off all of those clients. And then, of course, adding those SIDs to your pools. So you know, I want to go ahead and clone that. So I know that they work here. And I want to clone that so that I can then go elsewhere. So I'm like, oh, hey, you're on corporate-guest, and it's an open Wi-Fi, and you've connected to there before because there's some IT issues. And you know you weren't supposed to, but you did it anyway because it was open. You didn't even need a password. It's fun. And so now we clone that, and we go elsewhere. And when you go there and you're probing for it, you're probably going to connect. Um, and then that also leads into reporting, which we'll touch on more in just a bit. So we've added a lot of new features to PineAP. Um, actually, we've added a lot of features to um, the Wi-Fi Pineapple uh, Mark V over the last uh, almost two years now anyway, uh, now in version 2.4. Uh, and so two of the really big ones are uh, reporting and tracking. Uh, do you want to speak to either of those? Uh, yeah, sure. So the first one we have is reporting. It's It wasn't very easy before to get a good uh, report on what's actually going on with your pineapple. You could you know, deploy it somewhere and then pull the logs off so at some later point. You could log it to the SD card, but you need physical access. So we implemented reporting, which will basically gather your Karma or Pine AP log. It'll take a, 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 um, a command line version of the site survey or the recon mode, um, and it's going to implement the tracking, which I'll talk about in the next point. But basically, it'll take all the information that we gathered, uh, oh, sorry, and this uh, a CSV of, of Max and the SSIDs they've probed for. So you get a nice, you know, clean view of that, which you can import and actually analyze. And that can be emailed to you. It can be stored to the SD card in, you know, a histo histographical? Yeah, sure. Let's the go sure. Date let's go. Stamped. Dates, dates, thank you. So a date stamped format, right? So um, you have those options now. Yeah. Um, this is a really interesting one, too, because, you know, we can just set up a pineapple, say, uh, in a completely passive mode. Actually, we're skipping on some of these things that were added in 2.3, but a lot of passive logging capabilities were added in that version, uh, which makes reporting all the more useful if you drop it at a site and you have it uh, powered, say, in a ominous box or something like that, and it's doing just this reconnaissance and emailing you those reports or saving those reports to SD card. And that site survey can be really useful if you can now map where your clients of interest happen to go and when they go there. So, you know, if, if uh, it's the, you know, corporate guest Wi-Fi network and it sees these clients on these certain days, you can kind of come up with patterns. And uh, uh, this is something that might have even been useful for our, our tweaker friend to, to know when the security guard was coming around, uh, which leads really into tracking. Right, and then we added tracking, and tracking is is not a completely new concept to the pineapple. So what it does is it takes all the information we get about clients when you have logging turned on, at least. So uh, probe requests, or um, in general, if we see data in the air and you're scanning for it, if a, a client or a MAC address that you've specified is seen in the air, it will fire off a user configurable script. So you can say when that event happens, you want it to blink an LED or you want it to send you an email or something along those lines, right? So there's, it's, it's totally user customizable, but it means that there's a hook to every time you see a certain Mac, it'll, do a, it'll fire off a certain event. And again, with the reporting, it ties in with that and uh, can, can actually then fire off an email to you or be added to a list. So there's a timestamp list of when an SSID was seen, what it was doing, or sorry, when a, when a, a SSID, when a MAC address was seen, what it was doing or what it was currently looking for. And if it's got an SSID associated with it, it'll, look, it'll list the SSID and it'll email you that again in a report. Those are ducks. Uh, so what we're trying to do is make it easier to make sense of the Pine AP log and to, to really get some you know, interesting, you know, just get some value from that because there's a lot happening even if you're not you know, running Karma and also accepting those clients to connect to the Wi-Fi Pineapple. There's a lot of interesting information that you can glean that can be uh, useful for you on your pen test. So... Um, Kind of going forward, that's a lot of the emphasis, especially right now with the, the reporting, gathering that data and getting it to you in a, a convenient means, means that you'll be able to run it through some sort of analysis and uh, see if there's something interesting there. So we'll just do that now. Well, we... Uh, Can we set this up? Yeah, sure. So, uh, so we, we visited this place in, uh, in Mountain View, California. Um, just, you know, we're there to visit. And um, we uh, had a pineapple with us. Obviously, passive logging, totally legal. 
Um, and we got some really interesting results as we were talking about, you know, how devices stop probing. I think this is a really good place to, you know, test this on. So these were the results. And I'll be going ahead and publishing the script file um, on the Hack5 forums. But essentially what this does is it takes your uh, PineAP log and it processes it, uh, processes it in conjunction with the uh, IEEE um, OUI list, the uh, list of manufacturers. Uh, and so just from this little short engagement in the cafeteria where the food is all free and amazing, um, we were able to find out that uh, there were uh, about 255 unique probes and of those, they were from 334 devices. Uh, those devices spanned 154 OUIs. But of course, lots of manufacturers have various OUIs, those being the first three octets of a MAC address. So really, when you just take it down to the uh, manufacturers, it's really only 30 manufacturers. Uh, we were also able to say, OK, well, here are the top 10 manufacturers, which I was really surprised that this place in Mountain View used so many Apple products. Um, <laughs> Motorola's. Kind of good too, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. But what uh, surprised us more, I think, was um, the uh, the probes we received, or you know, saw. Just take a look. <laughs> I like the one that because they're unique. I like that sixteen devices were probing for that one thing. Yeah, that's not sixteen probes. That's sixteen unique devices. <laughs> they're uh, weird. Maybe it's a hackerspace. Um, some other improvements in version 2.4 added You're to the... No, we're not. No, we're not. You're, you're going so, <laughs> stop it. so some of them added in uh, 2.4 include um, b the ability to deauth all of the clients off of a uh, specific access point. Again, I'm brought in to audit this network. Here's uh, Acme Guest, Acme Corporate Wi-Fi, whatever have you. I uh, just want to be able to click it and say, you know, kick them all. Because previously, it was just a matter of clicking all of them. I know it's a convenience thing, but it's important, and you want to speak to that, don't you? Yes. So uh, you guys all know tools like MDK3, right? Uh, you know, Airdrop NG. Airdrop NG. Uh, you're able to, you know, kick off clients from, from access points. And that's all fun. And MDK3 has that thing called Amok Mode where you can kick off everything from every access point unless it's in your allow list. Or, or, or just Apple devices. Or just Apple or Google Glass or what have you, right? But uh, that's, that's while, while fun, oftentimes not really what you want in a, in a proper test. So what we added is deauthentication from recon mode, which allows you to, once you have a client scan done, uh, you're able to, you know, see the clients. You can click on a single client and you kick that client off. Um, that by itself isn't fun. So we added kick all clients from a client, uh, kick all clients from an AP because you might have to do that for some scenarios. We did not want to though do a proper deauth where we scan and look for everything that is currently on the access point for the duration of the deauthentication attack and kick off everything that we might have not seen. So what we do is we actually send targeted deauths to only the client devices you just saw and that you approved for the kicking off. So only those devices will be disassociated or dis, uh, um, deauthenticated and not devices that might have connected in the meantime just because you want to keep it clean and you want to limit collateral damage as much as possible. Right. And uh, likewise, it, the tool isn't built to also do any sort of continuous deauthing, um, and that kind of leads into the deauth multiplier. So we were trying to think of like what's a uh, what's a good way to set it up in such a way so that like sometimes some devices, you know, you, you kick them off, you know, maybe it takes I don't know what six, seven deauth packets, and then more, okay, and then it decides, okay, well, this access point doesn't want to be friends with me anymore. That's cool. I'll disconnect. What is the vendor? Well, most vendor implementations immediately want to now become friends again. Like, wait, what? I lost Wi-Fi. Oh, Wi-Fi. And they'll do that so many times until they finally eventually give up. What we didn't want to do, though, was just have it be continuous. So we set up multipliers where um, you could get that, like, say, three attempts before they stop trying and then go on to the next one in their PNL. And so it just seemed like the most obvious choice was to set a multiplier. So um, if you set it to two, that's going to be twice as many. If you set it to 10, uh, that, that's going to be a lot. Um, yeah, and me, moreover, uh, going in with the, the reporting and tracking functionality uh, spawned the ability to then also do the recon mode from the CLI. If that's where you're more comfortable, uh, the command is... 
site underscore survey. Yes. And so you basically get the same output, but of course now you don't get that t- contextual thing where you can click on an SSID or a MAC address and add them to lists and filters and uh, deauth them. Right. And we made it more prettier. So now we're going to talk about security, some of the things that worked and some of the things that didn't. And I want to take the first one. Um, who here uses pineapples are yummy as your password on your pineapple? Okay, you probably have a Mark IV. Um, that didn't work out so well. Who's using Tor as their password on Kali? Yeah, okay. So you guys are... Oh, everybody but Mubix is smart. Um, so yeah, that, that didn't work, obviously. And, and um, yeah, so hard-coded passwords are bad. Not doing that. So uh, another thing... Oh, do the shuffle. Okay. So anyway, uh, we... That was the Mark IV days. On the Mark V, we went through a lot of different things. The, one of the first things we did to kind of try to secure the, the tester a lot more from potential attacks uh, was to implement a WPA2 management interface, which meant that your packets can't just be sniffed out. You can't just get your, uh, your, um, your session ID. You can't get your session ID out of the air, which made it really easy uh, to you know compromise the pineapple. Uh, don't really like that, so we added the WPA2 management uh, interface. Uh, we added. Uh, oh, and, and it's forced. It's the default. Right. Yeah. Like so set d- it up when you- on initial setup, you have to configure this management interface. Uh, we also protect against cross-site request forgery now, which is something we just didn't really do before, and it's important that we do. Yeah. Yeah. I know. You can give me give me trouble for that. That's okay. Um, but we, you know, the scenario of where you're on a test and you're on a website that's targeting pineapples is something that we didn't really consider much. Um, and then we did presence verification. We previously did this with LEDs, and this is actually something that's going to lead into the point underneath. But uh, we said, okay, your pineapple has got four LEDs. One of them is fixed. It's a power LED. But, you know. Um, and to set up your pineapple, you have to, you know, uh, say which LED is either on, off, or blinking. That... Well, the, the importance of that, and our, our thinking there was, well, let's make it, sh- let's make sure that only the user of the Wi-Fi pineapple is setting up their own pineapple, and that that it's not somebody else accidentally connecting to theirs and trying to set it up. Because previously they were all set up with pineapple five underscore, you know, last two octets of the MAC address. Of course, now we force them to create a really creative management interface, SSID, and all of that. But um, yeah, so that didn't really work out so well, though. Because it turns out how, there's how many combinations? Not enough. So that when we locked ourselves out at some point because we broke the LEDs, we just brute forced it by saying on, 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 and just hitting enter 10 times and we ran. So that did not work. Um, so what we do now is to to make the initial setup, which was the most dangerous portion of the pineapple because somebody can race you to it and set it up and brute force his way in or her, his or her way in. Um, but uh, so what we do now is we require you to flip a dip switch. Now, that sounds scary because some people do over-the-air updates or they might not have access to their pineapple because it's in, a, in an ominous box and plugged into a wall. Some of them don't want to have to you know, undo the screws. Um, talk about that in a second. But basically what we did is we um, included uh, the possibility to, by flipping down the dip switches, it tells you to flip down. It'll disable the radios and then let you proceed with the setup by re-flipping them up. So that means the radios are disabled during initial setup. So it really is just you over Ethernet connected to the device. So you can set it up safely. You've got the time to do so. And you can't proceed with it. Unless your Ethernet cable is man in the middle. Right, Yes. Yeah. And then uh, on the uh, the other one is you just flip one of the dip switches that it tells you to flip, and uh, it's going to just leave Wi-Fi on and let you proceed because you might be at home setting up your pineapple for a test, and you don't really need to be that safe there. Of course, there's a workaround to that. Or not a workaround, but there's a convenience thing. Right. Yeah, exactly. So this is convenience. It's always convenience versus security. Um, and for this, if you want to skip this entire dip switch up, Totally, you just, on the SD card, add, uh, add a, a file that's listed in our change log, uh, skip dips, um, or skip dip setup, and uh, if you have that file on there, it'll just skip that portion entirely so you can actually deploy it like that. Because if you have physical access to the device anyway, it's owned. So uh, The next point is the reason why you should just stay in this room for the next talk. I know that we will be, because this sounds really interesting. Because um, Kenny's standing right there. He's... He's got a black hat on. I don't know what that's supposed to mean. <laughs> Why is brown? Okay. Uh, you want to speak to the CVE? Yes, sure. So uh, CVE 2015-4624. Uh, that is uh, 
that is a really fun um, vulnerability on the pineapple. That was basically a way to, first of all, you brute force the initial. We don't want to take away from the talk too much. No. Uh, do, do you want me to explain anything or skip it? Uh, well, we're going to cover it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I figured. Um, all right. To give you a really quick rundown, though. Oh, there you are. Um, right. So to give you a really quick rundown, um, Basically, you were able to skip, because of the LED setup, you were able to get past that quite quickly by brute forcing it. And then you were able to, uh, by having the default password, being pineapples are yummy, you know, because you're meant to change it. But you could skip that part, go directly to the login interface, log in, and then change the password and execute commands and so on and so forth. Yay. 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 So actually, quite a while ago, or I guess at least a year ago, we started looking into, like, Yo, dog, we should just use SSL. That was even before the WPA management interface, which was really just like, SSL is hard. Let's do WPA. <laughs> but um, there are some inherent problems with doing SSL in this kind of embedded device nature. Um, who here really enjoys installing certificates in your browser? Okay, McGrew really insta likes installing certificates in his browser. There, it's like It used to be... Like, what, file import or something. It used to be that easy. And uh, at least with Chrome and Firefox lately, it's just a real pain in the ass. Uh, so it's worse on Android. It is, yeah, a lot worse on Android. And so it's, it's again, balancing um, the convenience and the usability uh, and the security. And we should absolutely find some more convenient way to do this because I know when you were originally researching this, you've come up with something, but it's just like f for that subset, but for like everybody else, it's just going to be a real hassle. So... Um, it's built in, actually, and there's a wiki page on how to set it up. So you can do this. Um, we're just trying to find a way to like automate that process and make it more simpler. -er. Yes. Right, and then we have uh, things like today's Y'all Hunt Pineapples, right there. Um, no, so uh, we, uh, uh, we fixed the things that are on this list mostly, um, but uh, the, the inherent flaw on the network is that you can be ARP cache poisoned. So if you're connected to the same network and uh, you have to be the way that Pineapple is currently set up, you say you're connected to over Ethernet, you're using yourself as the default gateway, the victims have to have a connection through to you, which means an attacker can use that and he can get in between you and the actual Pineapple, and now you're getting your session stolen again. Right. There, there, there are a couple of ways to go about this. I guess one of the most simplest would be to implement client isolation. But again, that like creates a problem in that like I want to be able to like actually see my targets, not just their traffic, because I want to like scan them for any potential vulns and exploit them. So that's another one that we're just kind of still working on, and we've mocked up some stuff that works in certain scenarios, but not in others. And it really has to come down to like, well, what's the usability aspect here and um, and how do we you know find a way to put something together that's secure that's not also hindering a lot of your abilities and if it's just a checkbox that you're going to uncheck because you need to be able to access those then that's not going to work either so that's still one that we're toying with um, and then of course uh, the bug reporting aspect of it um, I'm fine with any method of disclosure but I should point out that we also do uh, accept bug reports at bugs at hack5.org as well as uh, wifipineapple.com slash security. And we have a bug tracker there as well. Uh, and actually, Kenneth, who's going to speak after us, uh, came directly to us um, at Pentest with Hack5, which was pretty cool. And we're both standing there looking over his code going, oh, that is so rad. So I can absolutely respect that. So going forward, so I could probably list like 50 esoteric features that I want implemented that are in the Trello doc, um, you know, uh, the, the list of, of all of the things that we want to add. The, uh, the he, he means what I need to do. Yeah, yeah. Like, I really like that one where you can just punch in a cross section of a street and then it'll download all the SSIDs from wiggle.net and then put them in your SSID pool, which is going to be epic because <laughs> I don't have to code it. <laughs> or I could, but it would look like the script that I'm about to show you. Anyway, um, but uh, the two biggest pillars, though, that were the paths that we're going down in the future is uh, both abstracting the engine and working on the pen test workflow. So I'll let you talk about abstracting the engine because PineAP, the engine itself, is really well built. And there's a lot of, 
awesome functionality there. But it's also in, in some ways tied to the interface. And what we want to do is get out of the way so that you can do what you do best. Right. So uh, we, we would like to... Dif uh, differentiate between what is the pineapple or the pineapple's engine and what is the way to manage it, what is the way to hook into it, what are the tools you can run in it, uh, because we simply have this device, and the device, the, the Mark V right now, is great at doing wireless. That is what it excels in, at least what I think, uh, or what we think. Um, what we're not so great with is it's a 400 megahertz processor. So you're not going to be running your, you know, Metasploit suite on it. You're not going to be running, uh, you know, full, uh, I don't know, all the man-in-the-middle tools that are written in Python or Ruby that are ginormous and have giant dependencies and require, you know, four gigabytes of RAM to run properly. Um, or, or you could get them to work slowly, but then... Yeah, next year. Oh, you've been able, or, <laughs> exactly. Well, yeah. no, you could get them to work slowly, but not with many clients. Like, we, we can handle, like, 200 clients. is no big deal. Wi-Fi side, yes. Yes. Yeah. So, yes. so the the issue isn't the Wi-Fi. Uh, it's the the what you do after you have the clients. So we're working on a way that you can basically take the clients and get them to a location where so they abstract the engine, the thing that does the thing, keep doing the Wi-Fi, and then offload tools and so on to other devices, be it uh, you know your ARM devices or your laptop or a device in the cloud, which runs your tools. But basically, we're going that direction with with this engine, so that you just you know you run a pineapple, it does the pulling of the clients, and um, right because you've done a fantastic job already with the API of making it really easy to write those infusions for say the web interface and all of the, those tools. Um, but it would be really better if, in addition to that, we could also take those same clients and just kind of like run them through what we're already used to doing. We don't need to reinvent the wheel here if you have a workflow, if you have tools that you're using. And so that's the other thing that we're working on is workflow in that uh, looking back at the 1.0 version of the Mark V, uh, it's really grown a lot and there's like so many features now. And so if you've been with the project for a long time, you're probably very familiar with where all of those options are. And when you get a new version, you're clicking around and, and realizing that we've, we've done a lot to make it easier. There's little help bubbles next to most of the big features that kind of explain what they do and how they work. But um, our next emphasis, in addition to abstracting the engine, would also be on creating like what is the, the pen test workflow. And it may differ uh, dramatically depending on you know who the client is and what kind of audit they're looking for. So what we're hoping to do is make it clearer, like, okay, here's the recipe for success. And if you're doing this kind of, you know, select a profile. If you're doing this kind of an audit, then these are the steps you may want to go through. And if you're doing that kind of, then these are the steps. And this is the report that you're going to get at the end of that. And if you've then done that and you're like, well, this works, great. Charge the, you know, uh, charged a bunch of money, did an audit, got them the report, they're happy, they call me again next year and want the same thing. I want you to be able to more easily do that again without having to you know, find all the things again. Yep. Oh, before we do that, do you want to, do you want yeah. to speak on uh, this? So, so there's also things you should not do with a pineapple. Um, one of those things is, uh, is this. Don't, don't do that. Uh, you look, you'll, you'll get arrested. It's just slightly obvious. Yeah. Um, but you gather interesting information. If, if yeah, there, there's lots of fun things you can do passively, but then like trying to explain it to the uh, NPS is, is always interesting too. Um, Wi-Fi geocaching, just go with that. <laughs> there is, find us off camera. And um, and with that, let's do some ASCII Q and A. Yes. So I've tried to use the, the radios between each other—one to be a client and one to reserve via the AP. So there's been some speed issues. I've followed on the forums and saw that you guys work to fix that. Is there any more work? Is that just the hardware limitation between the bridge going through the chip, or what's your thought on that? Uh, what we've found is that we get the best throughput when we use a third radio, um, and we recommend, the, of course, the Alpha NEH, which we supply. I, I, yes? <laughs> That's okay. Well, um, I guess we should address that in saying that initially from the onset of the Wi-Fi pineapple, I mean, th you're looking at it, uh, you know, uh, the two of us, uh, launching the Mark V, big dreams of Pine AP, and of course, some things get finished before others. So... 
when we launched the device, we really went with the software-wise. There were a lot of improvements, but it was also the best that we had had on the previous generation. But, of course, we built the custom hardware dreaming of what is possible when we have a dedicated interface for that constant sniffing and packet injection. And that there was the sketch on the board of, like, this is what the Piney P future is going to look like, so let's make hardware for that. Um, so we put the cart a little bit before the horse there, and in that case, we're like, okay, well, what are, what are we doing with WLAN 1? So we threw in client mode, which turned out to be, like, a huge feature that everybody loved. So then later when we came out with Pine AP, which requires WLAN 1, it then got a little trickier where it's like, okay, well, okay, well, we want to make it optional but because some people are like using this, but really we want it to be the dedicated inter interface that you use to support that first interface. We don't want to tie up WLAN 0, the, the Atheros doing Karma, with too many other tasks because then we're going to start dropping clients, and that's not what we want. Um, and yes, we did also run into throughput issues. And so we did uh, dev another board and, uh, and solved one issue and broke several others. And I wish it was as easy as it is. Because Seb's got it easy. He just has to do code. He just hits F5 and it says warning or doesn't compile. And then he like put, does the, he hits semicolon. This is what you do, Seb. You just like that. And then, and then like the, the code happens. And so he just hits F5 and compiles again. Like we've got to like do. Yes. So it's much more difficult to do revs, and I can show you boards that, like, hey, this is fixed, and now we totally screwed over storage. So, um, yeah, maybe we'll put those in the, the museum. We've got, like, a, all these shadow boxes of all of the various uh, prototype boards that, uh, for some reason or another, are derpy. carry on working on new things because there are clearly things that we can improve. We could add more processing. We could add 5 gigahertz. Yeah. We could you know, add an SSD. You never know, right? So I'm not saying there's not going to be a Mark 6. Um, but it is definitely one of those things where uh, with this abstraction of the engine, it wouldn't impact that either because the engine would be abstracted from the device and from the tools that would be running on your computer or on your Android phone or on your what have you, right? So uh, we want to kind of be able to, you know, you pull out your Android phone, you connect to your pineapple, manage it from there. Might be through an Android app because it's agnostic, right? It wouldn't care what you're doing for management, which also means that anyone can write apps for it. Anyone can, you know, hook into it. You can have big integrations into entire other systems and so on. So we're working on that. We want to go ahead, get hooks into uh, into Kali that just make that totally painless. We want to get hooks or like modules for Metasploit out and just kind of, you know, make ourselves more integrated. Integrated. Yes. Um, but no, I mean, that's like asking Apple if there's going to be an iPhone 7. Mm -hmm. So, um, you think there's going to be an iPhone 7? They're, they're, I think they're stopping though. Yeah. No, 802.11 AC. We could go on and on and on. In fact, I, I love hearing people shout out. Like we had people at B-Side sell us. They wanted uh, BTLE. Um, okay. Uh, maybe we can also, you know, work better with things like the Uber Tooth or something like that. But yes, there was another question over here. No, completely original. <laughs> Anyone else? Cool. All right, thank you so much for letting us do this.